Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to another session of Construction Business Management. In today's section, we're going to be discussing motivation and engagement of your employees. In the construction sector, we work with a lot of people. We work with our own employees. We look, work with uh, trade partners. We work with consultants. There's a lot of engagement that we need to be making. And so we've been talking about HR management in the previous lectures. And if you haven't had a chance to check them out, I've got a listing down below in the description. And you can also subscribe and go to the playlist under Construction Business Management to review the other uh, videos, which are really about setting up, starting a construction business. So we're now at the later stages of the course, and we are looking at management techniques uh, that will help you to better take advantage of the skills and talents of your workforce. Very often in construction, we kind of think about things, and I've mentioned this before, uh, in terms of working in the business instead of working on the business. Well, how we work with our employees, the relationships we build with our employees, how we reward our employees, how we think about our employees, uh, has a lot to do with how engaged they will be uh, in our business and to have a competitive advantage in the construction industry it you will have a competitive advantage if you have a very engaged workforce and you've done a lot of the things that we talked about in the previous lectures about uh, interviewing and hiring the best people for the actual role and so we'll look at some of the factors an organization should consider when trying to motivate others uh, what will be their motivators? What are the things that trigger? Everybody's different. And so there's different triggers for different people. One, one size does not necessarily fit all. That's why you see mid-size to large-size organizations. They have a bunch of different things that they um, use to help uh, engage their employees. And as a manager, whoever the direct report is of that individual has a dramatic effect on how that individual views the actual company as a whole. So you can work for a great company and have a very ineffective manager leader and that can cause a lot of issues for you. Uh, and you may not appreciate just how good the company is that you're working for. Uh, on the other hand, you could work for a so-so company and have a really good manager and still feel pretty good about that company just because of the manager you've been um, dealing directly with. That has a huge influence on people. So leadership and management plays an important role. We're going to focus in on uh, a little bit about uh, some of the management theories that are out there, that motivational theories that are out there. Uh, uh, that have been studied in organizational behavior and how some of its application and thoughts can help you better understand uh, dealing with and working with and uh, engaging with your employees. Uh, in a follow-up video, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the more current research that's been done, such as positivity theory, grit, uh, and um, flow theory. Uh, so we'll look at some of those aspects as well. And we talked about grit a little bit if you took that grit survey earlier in the course. Um, we'll, we'll hone in on that a little bit more. Uh, one of the leaders that I kind of admire that I've uh, discussed before in the course is uh, Richard Branson. Uh, I think if you work for a virgin company overall, again, there's always nuances. Um, you would probably have a little bit different kind of experience than some uh, businesses and I think one of the things that I appreciate about uh, Branson is that um, he recognizes that not everybody is suitable for every particular job but usually within a larger organization if you put them as Jim Collins would say uh, put them in the right seat uh, there's usually a, a good connection there and so he says when I started my first businesses I didn't know how to go about all manner of different jobs but I have knack for finding people who did I have no special talents for most tasks, but know how to empower people who do. Whether it was the smartest accountant, the most connected music scout, or the finest pilot, I found people who were better than me and gave them the support and freedom to flourish. So those are important aspects. You don't necessarily have to, what he's saying there is, you don't necessarily have to be the best at everything. If you can get the right people to do the right jobs, uh, you will flourish, you will have a competitive advantage. And when we think about construction, there's so many specialities in the construction industry. Nobody knows everything about everything, right? And if they say they do, they really don't. Uh, so you want to get 
people that are really good at certain things. And then if you actually get that sort of team built up and coordinated and engaged, you're going to be very successful. He said, in the meantime, I learned from them and vice versa. Delegation and surrounding myself with great people have been the hallmark of Virgin's growth. So think about a typical construction business and all those people that you deal with on a daily basis. And this also holds for the trades that you work with. That's why it's equally important that you treat your trade partners really well because you want them to want to work with you. And then you're going to attract the best of the trade partners as as opposed to putting them off. And then that's going to have a detrimental impact uh, to um, your business. And so we say that the importance of selection and motivation becomes self-evident. So keep this in mind as we go through this uh, module. All right. So um, some of the things that we need to think about uh, with developing potential through motivation, uh, maximizing your employees' benefits uh, or capabilities. Benefits include um, their satisfaction levels. Well, how satisfied are they with their job? You know, if, if your employees, again, it comes, kind of comes down to this, is, is it just a career for them? Like, or is it, is it just a job to get a paycheck? Is it a career, so a little bit broader, higher level? Or is it kind of a calling for them? There's different levels in there as far as motivation. And that's where some of the motivation theories too come in, is understanding um, the different uh, levels. But if you expect to get some employee loyalty, uh, you're going to have to have some pretty good things in the relationship side uh, going on with that employee. Um, improved uh, efficiency. So if you really do maximize their capabilities, they will be much more productive. They will provide more quality because they'll take more pride in what they're doing. They'll have higher levels of self-confidence and self-efficacy, which means when problems come up and they do come up in construction, they'll be better able to um, resolve and solve those particular is issues and problems as they arise and be able to work on it in a more collaborative basis. Uh, that will lead to higher employee retention rates. Well, if you're falling down on these ones, you're not going to retain your employees that much. And if you're falling down on these ones, they're not going to be too engaged most likely. And so you're not going to be getting the best uh, from them. So those are important. Uh, and that will really, if you, if you are following through with these, you will have higher levels of engagement. So there's this sort of uh, statement here. Do you think it's possible to induce commitment by persuading individuals to expand considerable effort on an activity in the absence of a clear external reward for doing so? And so when we're saying an external reward, it's kind of the carrot aspect of if you do this, we'll reward you with this, you know, it could be a bonus, it could be uh, extra pay, it could be um, uh, a promotion, something though that's external to the employee. And we call that extrinsic rewards, right? Um, so would you be um, persuaded to be actually committed to putting in some extra effort into an activity? Um, and, you know, most people will tend to say um, no. Most people will, on the surface, tend to say that. But uh, really, and the reality of the, the matter is that uh, a lot of people, they don't have to have that large extrinsic reward. And we'll talk about that. It doesn't mean that we don't need, want to get paid. We do want to get paid. But beyond a certain level of pay, it's not going to have the same kind of impact. If you're trying to put food on the table, yes, it will have that impact. Uh, so if you're worried about paying the rent or you're worried about putting the food on the table, yes, it will definitely up to that level. As it goes beyond that, meaning you feel comfortable, uh, you're not stressed out about your, your job security and putting food on the table the next week, uh, bonuses and that, they tend to diminish off. So you can just picture it. You know, if you're, and there's, it's, it's got kind of a little bit of a flexibility. It depends where you are, what country, where, what, what level of pay you are in. It can even differ in Canada, you know, from Toronto to somewhere more, much more rural. Toronto, the cost of living is quite high in Toronto. So it would take a higher benchmark pay than say, uh, say uh, some uh, town outside of Win Winnipeg, maybe three, four hours outside Winnipeg. Um, 
much lower cost of living. So it might not take as much for you to feel comfortable in that case. Um, so what is that level? Well, it depends. You know, it could be 70,000 a year. It could be 100,000 a year. It could be 40,000 a year. But let's say you're making 140,000 a year. Well, a 10,000 bonus, that's okay. It's nice. And you would get a little bit of a bump from it, but it's not going to make a, a crazy difference to you. If you're making 40,000 a year and you're struggling to pay everything, a 10,000 bounce would be a quite significant bounce for you. So yeah, that would tend to have uh, a much more um, extrinsic, uh, extrinsic motivation for you. The, basically the motivational drive would be higher in that example. Even though it's the same dollar amount, it depends in the context that it's put in. So that's what also happens with employees as well. Um, so uh, psychologists call this insufficient justification, unable to identify a clear external rationale for exerting effort on a task. You may believe the effort's wasted, as I mentioned, if there's not a reward or some sort of something waiting for you. Um, but the person may determine there's some higher altruistic purpose. If, if your people are really into what they're doing, uh, and so to meet a certain quality expectation, to meet a certain craftsmanship expectation, they can get into a, a, what we call a flow state and that work just goes much more smoothly and they don't necessarily have to have a reward beyond um, those minimum aspects that I was uh, mentioning. Um, so, um, as I said, you need a certain level, but beyond that, it may not be as um, high for those um, aspects. It's, it's, it's always interesting too, when you look at artists' work, uh, some of the most famous artists in history uh, when they were commissioned to do the work as opposed to when they did the work for the love of doing the work, uh, the best work or the most famous work that's come out of it tends to be more where they weren't commissioned to do the work. So the most creative, uh, high level of um, artistry and mastery of their crafts tends to be more aligned with uh, when they did it for some altruistic purpose as opposed to an extrinsic reward. So it's something to keep in mind as we go through this. So uh, external measures as money, as I mentioned, that can have some um, uh, positive effects, but it's very short-lived. That's the other thing with extrinsic rewards. So when we do performance reviews and we have our employees, definitely, you know, they're looking for feedback and if we're trying best is really to sort of separate the actual money review with a performance review on how well they're working and how well they're learning at what they're doing because then you try to tr keep those two kind of uh, separate from each other not in the same meeting let's say uh, but motivation by external uh, measures uh, such as um, money it can be much more short-lived so a lot of companies they'll They'll have a yearly uh, review and this will determine their bonus. And if, uh, if you have an employee, they tend to do more coming up to the review because they know the review is close by and we have what we call recency bias. So you as their manager remembers, what have you done for me lately? More than maybe what they did four months ago, five months ago, six months ago. So in other words, they could have had a stellar first eight months uh, but if the last four months have been just okay, you'll tend to remember just the okay part instead of the stellar first eight months. So that's kind of something that um, happens. So rather than have that occur, most employees really step it up uh, the, la the more current four months. And the first eight months, uh, some of them might not have done that well, but they could be, it could be give you a misconception of what's going on if you're reviewing them. Um, and uh, that really, uh, in many cases, extrinsic rewards can actually diminish uh, performance, as I used the example in um, artists. Uh, but you can also think about it in terms of misaligned goals. Sometimes if you have an extrinsic reward that's based on getting something done, well, it might get done, but it causes other issues or other problems because the, maybe the goal wasn't structured that well. And we'll talk about that um, in some examples because having a misaligned bonus system can really cause negative impacts on your business. All right, so kind of this example of be careful what you wish for. So I've got this little case study here 
And the case study is of this large North American home building company. And they build thousands of homes per year. And the owner declared that um, there were too many closings that were being needlessly de delayed. So you build thousands of homes per year. And it seems like there's a lot of them that are delayed. And you get unhappy purchasers when some of them are delayed. And uh, that becomes uh, a problem because don't forget purchasers, they sell their existing home, they make all these things to set up. And then if the house gets delayed, causes them all kinds of uh, logistical issues. So they had to make changes with lenders, moving companies, uh, rearrangements for holidays and all these other things that come into play. Uh, and in some cases, mandatory warranty programs like in Ontario, Canada, you have to worry about uh, reporting the delay uh, within a certain time period. Otherwise, um, the actual um, builder has to compensate a certain amount for hotels and other things that the client may the purchaser may have to be put up in. Um, so uh, the other thing is uh, they looked this builder looked at it. Well, that's kind of a negative uh, impact on us. And also this builder is very conscious that they wanted to be rated uh, very high in their um, surveys that were being conducted. JD Power used to survey uh, the home builders and see how they were doing and they wanted to have a number one rating. And uh, so that was something that they were striving for. It was part of their strategic goals that they were after. And we've talked about developing a strategy and having goals in the earlier videos. Um, so the owner determined that improved performance incentives would provide increased motivation. So there was a bonus that would be um, added if they actually closed the houses on time. And so it was an extrinsic reward. We're talking money here. So that's extrinsic as opposed to intrinsic, which is more altruistic or more craftsmanship-like um, aspect to it. So the construction team was ecstatic with this new bonus system, and they worked in really hard to make sure that people were able to move in on time. One problem, within six months, it was noted there was a huge increase in post-closing deficiencies and warranty problems. In other words, they met the goal of closing on time, but to do that, they sacrificed on quality. And then all these warranty issues started coming up later on. And the warranty issues far exceeded um, the benefits of closing on time. There was huge cost implications to that. So now you're paying a bonus for to close on time. You're closing on time, but now you've got all these warranty issues. Now, because you're closing on time, you're paying all of these bonuses. So that's extra money that's going out. And you're paying a lot more in warranty issues. And on top of it, People weren't happy. They were moving in houses and they had all these issues. Think about it. If you buy a new car, brand new car, you drive it off the lot and it starts having issues because it was not put together that well, you're really upset with it. You probably would have been happier to wait a few weeks for the new car if it meant that it wouldn't have all these issues. Uh, so it's kind of like that. You're living in this house and it's got all these problems. You're kind of getting fuming about it, right? Uh, so um, it's not only the construction industry that this happens. It also happened in 2008 financial crisis uh, where mortgages were provided to people that shouldn't have gotten mortgages. And then, of course, later on, they couldn't pay the mortgages. And it becomes su such a, a big thing that it almost collapsed the whole global financial system. Uh, so it was really a, a case of where there was a, a myopia, where people were just focused in so heavily on meeting these targets that they didn't see the forest for the trees. So when we think about extrinsic motivation, when you think about bonuses, be careful what you wish for. Now, if you design it and you've considered certain things, like in this particular example, the warranty uh, services department took over all the warranty issues. So there was no moral hazard for the site supers or the project team on these deficiencies. The warranty pro program of the company, the different that department ended up taking that on. So now you're just shifting it somewhere else and that's becoming problematic. So perhaps if it was redone, you could realign the goals so that yes, it has to close on a certain time, but 
it has to have you know this small amount of warranty issues and you could have set it up too that in order to get the bonus there had to be uh, a clear um, review by the QC QA department prior to to ensure that things were at the expected quality level so there's ways of designing your your goal system to try to make sure that it doesn't have some sort of dysfunctional um, consequence to it which becomes important intrinsic motivation that's it's coming from inside so that's the the aspect that i i want you to think about when we talk about intrinsic motivation a lot of people have a little bit more trouble understanding intrinsic motivation you know extrinsic some something that's from outside that's being rewarded that's kind of clear it doesn't have to be dollars necessary it could be a trip it could be it could be uh you know a plaque on a wall those types of things those are extrinsic intrinsic is you feel good about doing this you feel you enjoy it uh you're not you know we are working but it's just it doesn't feel like work right uh we're in a level of what we call flow where the work just goes and if you're a student if you've been a student you know when you work on an assignment uh some assignments they're kind of like drudgery but other ones you get into it and you're working and all of a sudden a few hours goes by and you don't know where did that time go it just flew by uh that's you were in a level of flow and that's an intrinsic motivation right so that's an intrinsic motivation that puts you uh into that uh level of flow uh which we'll look at uh in uh, one of the upcoming uh module videos and slides coming up uh, so uh, definitely intrinsic motivation you know the difference is it can be much more longer lasting like people that are on a project and they've got a good level of intrinsic motivation going on it doesn't just have to be flow you got a good collaboration and engagement with your team members uh, that's why I like uh, lean construction methodologies it really works very hard at trying to get people engaged in the process uh, respected in the process it puts a lot of effort into um, those processes and if you get that sort of engagement it helps to promote intrinsic motivation um, which is important from um, that perspective you know we do have some well-known theories and I think it, I, I wouldn't be doing you a service if I didn't sort of uh, quickly mention that in this course uh, that it's the background for it. So people that study organizational behavior, how businesses work, how businesses function, uh, it's an important aspect of that. And you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you might have learned about in high school. They usually mention that one. It's probably the most well known. But I did want to go through some of them here just to uh, give you some idea of its application in, in the real world. But by understanding extrinsic motivation and how it can go sideways on you if you will you know this is real stuff and you could put this to a lot of different things a lot of different construction businesses in a lot of different scenarios of how this works and that's one of the reasons why sometimes we have issues with trade partners where we paid them a certain amount to do this job and so their main goal is to get in and to get out in as short a time as possible but sometimes in doing that they kind of sidetrack and cause issues with the rest of the project because maybe they're bringing in too many materials at one time maybe they're getting in the way of a certain amount of work maybe they're delaying coming and then they're gonna you know blitz the place and then there's too many uh employees too many tradespeople working at one time which causes a stack effect all of these things can be related to how, what's motivating that individual company to try to do things and trying to understand the psychology behind that is helpful in you running a business because you'll kind of sort of pick up on what's going on otherwise you never really think about it and if you don't really think about it then stuff's just happening and if it's just happening you're in reactive mode so it's important from that perspective is why this is being included in this module so Maslow's Vroom's expectancy and theory x and theory y as I mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs it's been around for a long long time uh, all kinds of you know you always see this sort of triangle um, that's um, utilized uh, where you go from the lower levels the physiological uh, which is what like what I'm saying you really at the lower levels you're looking at uh, where you actually um, 
uh, basically are trying to get your basic levels of food, uh, roof over your head, uh, etc. But as it moves up to like esteem and self-actualization, then that's those higher level items um, are getting away from uh, the aspects of, you know, I got to have a certain level of money um, bonus to get me to be uh, at working at a higher level of creativity and spontaneity. That's not the way it, it works. Uh, at those points, you're getting into a more altruistic view of things and you're doing it for mastery of that field. Uh, you're doing it because you're helping somebody else. And so really, too, part of that is how do you frame your projects to your workers? And are they sensing that there is this aspect of adding value to your customers and who you're interacting with? And if I'm to use lean terminology, your customer is anyone you're providing something to, uh, not necessarily who's paying you. Uh, so that could be the painter, uh, the drywaller is basically providing value to the painter if they leave walls that don't need any touch-ups. Right? If they do a really pristine job that all the painter has to do is paint, that's valuable to the painter, the customer. Right? Of course, the customer is at the, the highest level, the person that is paying for the actual um, project. But it is good to think about it um, from those perspectives. What's adding value to the customer? And um, it's not always about money. It's about what is it? What is it and what is it that they value? So um, you can think of it uh, from that perspective. And also with Maslow, uh, it also kind of has to do with demographics, age as an example, younger people uh, that are starting out in the industry. Well, they are going to be more focused because they haven't been promoted. They're probably at the lower end of the food chain on pay and that sort of thing. Uh, so this, this lower spectrum may uh, end up being more important, right? And employment, especially when we're talking about the employment aspect of um, safety and also safety on a construction project, right? If they feel, if your employees feel you don't care about their safety and you're trying to cut corners all the time, what kind of loyalty are you going to get from them? Really, what kind of loyalty do you expect to get from your employees? And you can say, well, they get paid, so they should be happy. I don't know about you, but I do know the construction industry in North America. You know what? There's a shortage of workers there. And for the most part, if somebody's halfway decent in construction and they're not happy with you, it's not going to be rocket science for them to get a job with somebody else. And so wouldn't you be better if you've re spent that time and effort recruiting really good people to try to nurture that workforce to be even better and to help give you and your business a competitive advantage, I'm going to say yes, it's a big advantage to do that because there's a lot of businesses that don't do it and they are constantly going through a revolving door of employees. Big difference, big difference. So think about that if you're going to be starting a business, how fundamentally important that is. It is really a big, important part of that aspect. Another theory, organizational theory, to think about is Vroom's expectancy theory. And Vroom's expectancy theory really looks at motivational force. All of these theories, you can look up YouTube videos, you can look at Google them, you'll see a lot more information than I'm giving here. But really, it's about what does somebody value? Do they think they can do it? And if they do it, are you going to actually follow through with them? That's what expectancy theory is all about. Um, so there's a causative correlation between effort and performance. You'll get more effort if you structure things and provide things properly. Uh, if you if you really look at rooms, you can even go online and you'll see, you know, if you Google it, like I said, there's a formula that you can put in place. I don't think anybody's sitting down putting a formula on this, all right? But in the theory behind it, it does make sense and you can visualize it. There's three components, valence, expectancy, and instrumentality. And valence is a fancy way of saying value. What do you value? So if I'm going to give an extrinsic reward, such as a, you're going to get a cruise, uh, a free cruise to Alaska, right? If you 
do X, Y, Z. Okay, so if you're in the construction sector and uh, we make a 10% profit on this particular project and it finishes on time, uh, we're going to send you on a two-week cruise of um, Alaska taking off from Seattle. All right. Well, you know what? For some people, that would be over the moon great. For other people, why do I want to go Alaska? It's cold. I don't like the cold. Uh, you know, they wouldn't value it that much. It, if, it, if they don't value it, it's not going to give them that extra push to really try to accomplish that goal, right? What do they value? That's where an extrinsic reward, it can get a little bit of a push um, from that perspective. Not long lasting, but it may be enough to get that specific thing that you're trying to accomplish uh, in, in that example. Um, so a valence could also be, well, we're gonna assign you to if you do this well on this project, we're going to assign you to this other project. And maybe the other project is a LEED Platinum Building certification. And you are really into energy efficiency and sustainability. And this would be a dream job for you to manage a LEED Platinum project. Well, that would be an intrinsic reward for you. That would be an intrinsic driver. And you would really value that. That would probably get you really engaged in trying to accomplish this Goal. So you would have high value for that in that case. So intrinsic or extrinsic, they can work. Now, if you're the one going back to the original example, if you're the one that is, uh, you know, doesn't like the cold weather, well, maybe if it's changed and it's actually a Caribbean cruise, that might be different. Now, all of a sudden, it's a big deal for you, right? So, um, but that's what valence. You got to value it. What level do you value it at? And if if you don't then that's not going to be it. So management has to kind of figure out what do their employees value. That's why bigger companies, you usually have different things, different reward systems. It's not always just one thing. They have different things that they actually um, do from that perspective. Um, so management uh, needs to look at that. Expectancy. All right. So if, from an expectancy uh, point of view, do you think that you can actually do it? Can you accomplish what you're trying to uh, do. All right. So we said uh, we'll give you a cruise to Alaska and you're all gung ho about it. But do you believe you can actually close this project and make that 10 percent profit on it? If you don't believe you can do it, it's going to be a demotivator. It's not going to get you fully engaged. You like it, but there's no chance I can do it. So you have to as a manager or a business owner, try to identify these things and then find out why don't you think you can do it? Well, because what you're asking me to do involves this other department and this other department, they never come through. And so that means I can, even though I do everything, it's on the critical path. It's not going to happen, right? Well, that's good feedback because if I'm the manager, maybe I could help stick handle with the other department. I could talk to the manager in the other department and make sure that this is prioritized to remove that roadblock so now you're re-engaged. Or maybe it requires you to be really efficient at this productivity tool such as Procore for this to happen and you don't even know how to use Procore so you have very little confidence or self-efficacy that you can do that. So again, if I know that, well then maybe we can set you up with some training so you can figure that out. So that's understanding from a management perspective to an employee perspective where there might be gaps and being able to fill those gaps. Instrumentality. Well, this is very important from a business owner perspective. If you're running this business and you say you're going to do something and then you don't do it, then you've lost all trust. So why would I do it again the next time? You know, if you say somebody's going to get a bonus if they do this and they do it and then they don't get the bonus or they're going to get promotion if they do this and you say, well, sorry, we can't really do it right now because of X, Y, Z. You've just basically taken the steam out of all future engagements from that perspective because they're going to say the next time you start selling them or upselling them on some big thing that they're going to get. Yeah, heard that story before. So you really want to sink yourself. Don't follow through with promises you made with your employees. And that'll, that's a good way to getting nowhere. Uh, on the other hand, if you uh, back up what you say and you keep to your commitments, 
then that will have a very positive impact. So it's how these three actually work together that determines motivational force, what Vroom would call motivational force. And as I said, I don't think people are sitting down with a calculator. These are usually given uh, variable numbers to work with, but what you have to understand, if any of them are zero or low, the motivational force is non-existent. So you have to look at ensuring that you have them in place, that there'll be sufficient motivational force to get that whatever it is you're trying to do or accomplish done. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, I think it's a, from a high level, from a management point of view, from a business point of view, it's not a bad way just of thinking things through. And if you sort of have that in the back of your mind, it's very helpful from a business perspective. There's also theory X and theory Y, another motiv motivational theory, uh, which is, um, I find very interesting. So it was uh, developed by Douglas McGregor and kind of um, took out some of the aspects of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but he also looked at how companies uh, operated from. And, uh, you know, I could get into the whole history of um, Adam Smith and basically, uh, um, uh, basically how he felt that people, Adam Smith was the world's uh, first really modern economist and how um, basically made a statement that people are basically work slovenly, like a sloth, think of a sloth, how slow they move, unless they are given the right emoluments, emoluments money. So it was really that extrinsic reward. So you got to assume if I don't pay like really bonus and, you know, watch people like a hawk, micromanage them, uh, then... Uh, we're not going to be successful. So that's theory X. That's how some people think. That's how a number of small business managers think. That's how most of North America thought in the eight more North America, the UK uh, in the 1800s, right? The industrial revolution leading up to about 1950, 50, 1960 in that period. And then it started to shift and started to shift to more theory Y. So theory Y is different than theory X, but theory X is you really don't um, trust people to do the work unless they are really um, watched closely. Now, McGregor said that's not true, and his research said that's not true. Um, what he said was basically companies would achieve at best mediocrity. It's not that a company can't survive, but it will not be performing at its potential, right? And it kind of follows along line with, in a modern context with some of the work done by Jim Collins that we've talked about before in the course, good to great. Uh, you know, great companies are not operating under theory X uh, for the most part. There's always exceptions. There's always exceptions. But uh, for the most part in today's environment and culture, in the developed world. Now, in the developing world, there's a lot more Theory X uh, going on. There's a lot more Theory X, just as there was here, a lot more Theory X going on. And things, by the way, they don't always have to be Theory X or Theory Y. There's always gray areas too. So that's the other thing to keep in mind with this. But if you really want people to be working creatively, innovatively, problem-solving way, uh, really moving things along, then you really want to start thinking about, uh, well, if Theory X is only going to get us so far, right? Theory Y, McGregor said, um, offers a more accurate assessment of the human condition and a more effective starting point. It's really thinking more in terms of the intrinsic values that employees have in their work if they're given the freedom and latitude. doesn't mean that you don't have rules and policies and other things in it in effect, but it does mean that you have a, a certain level of trust that your employees are going to do the right thing uh, with um, out being micromanaged. So the perspective held that taking an interest in work is as natural as play or rest. That's a, a strong aspect of theory why. That creativity and ingenuity are widely distributed that under proper conditions, people will accept and even seek more responsibility. Uh, that if your starting point is theory Y, the possibilities are vast for both you and the individual. I remember there when I was managing at um, acting director at our college, uh, I remember I had an employee and um, this employee 
honestly, they took on the role of three people. They just kept their their job kept growing because they wanted it to grow because there were things they liked on the peripheral of what they did. And over the decades, quite honestly, they were very efficient, very productive. I remember the dean saying to me, well, we should be thinking about um, replacing this individual. I said, you're going to have to get three people to replace this in individual. And the dean said, there's no way you need three people to replace one person. I said, I think you do. You're not going to find somebody that has that skill set and that works that productively. Sure enough, when that person retired, they hired two more and hired that person back to work part time. So really, in a sense, three people. Uh, that in, it wasn't that that individual was burned out or that was not unhappy. They loved it, right? And they were engaged with what they do. And if you have enough of those types of employees, life becomes very easy from running a business perspective to managing a business perspective. It just becomes easy. You want flow. You want easiness in your work. You run your business under that um, uh, auspices and you'll see a lot of the results that will come um, your way. So the theory why is uh, a huge advantage to businesses from that perspective. And that's what McGregor was trying to say. If you want to get to the upper end of um, those areas, um, theory why would uh, provide a lot more of those opportunities. So as I said, it doesn't, doesn't mean though that there's not S some elements of maybe some aspects of theory X that might be mixed in theory Y with some companies. It's not always this perfect divide uh, that takes place. But my experience, um, theory Y will get you further that way. Uh, it'll make you enjoy running your business a lot more, to be honest. Uh, even my dad, when I was a kid, you know, I can remember theory X we would, uh, you know, it'd be a Friday afternoon uh, and uh, we were maybe in Etobicoke uh, and it's Friday afternoon and it's 3.30. I'd think, okay, good, we're finishing early. And he'd want to go to Scarborough. That's the other end of the city uh, because he wanted to check if anybody had left early from the other job. Uh, so there was a certain level of mistrust in there. I'd be more concerned, did they get done what they needed to get done that day? If they did, and then they could finish a little bit early. So on the other hand, like I said, my dad on certain with certain employees, he would have the theory why thing. If you get this done, you can go. And so uh, that would be more theory why. So maybe there was a little inconsistency there. Uh, but definitely I would want to try to develop the relationships that if the employee wants to leave early, they would have given me a call, let me know. We did this, 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 we're done. And that would be okay. Um, as opposed to where you, a Theory X environment, that's where you see everybody, they're sitting at their desk and they're waiting for 4.59 and 5, and now we can leave. Uh, theory Y employees, if they're into something and they're enjoying it, 4.59, 5, 5.10, 5.20, 5.30, I want to get this done, I'm into it, 6 o'clock, I'm still working on it I'm because I want to finish it because I'm taking pride in what I'm doing. It's a little bit different. The other one's going to be gone. They'll stay till five, but that doesn't mean they were necessarily as productive. So you have to think about that. Think about your own self, how you've worked in jobs and what you appreciated and what you didn't appreciate about some jobs. And that will help you come to that realization. It also has a little bit to do with culture. So it you know it depends if in in because I teach this uh, course at University of Toronto as well on human resource management. I get people from all over the world. And it's been really enlightening for me doing that course over the last 15, 20 years, uh, the, the different perspectives. So yes, if you're in a developing country, it might be much more towards theory X. And culturally, culturally, that might be more accepted in those environments. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden you jump in completely different than what your culture is used to. But I would be looking at what elements of theory, why I could bring into that to bring up uh, my culture that way. Um, things evolve. Things don't always stay static. So keep that in mind as well. So that's what I wanted to cover in this uh, uh, lecture here. And I'm going to do a follow up to this one, which will get into um, a couple of more contemporary uh, theories uh, in uh, motivation and engagement. But be thinking about how, if I'm going to be going through all this trouble, human resource manage management, hiring people, uh, looking at payment systems, looking at review systems, and uh, trying to uh, get the work done. 
How can I best engage them and work with them that makes them really, really want to be engaged in the work that they're doing? Easiest is if you hire the right people and then you got to work to not disengage them. You can hire the right people and then disengage the right people and then they'll look elsewhere. You know why? They have choices. And in the construction industry, unless you're really not very good, you have a lot of choices. And if you're not really good, yeah, you're going to get stuck with all these people on, in your business that aren't really good. And that is not going to get you a competitive advantage. So I'm Tom Stevenson, wishing you a wonderful day and giving you something to think about with running the business. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.